From the Lean Enterprise Institute in Boston, this is the WLEI Podcast, where we share stories of people making the world better through lean thinking and practice. For more information about LEI, including how we can help you apply lean thinking, please visit lean.org. Hi there, and welcome to WLEI, the podcast of the Lean Enterprise Institute. I'm Tom Ehrenfeld, an editor with LAI. Many of us in the lean community are passionate about the appeal of making work better. But what if in order to do so, we need to simply ensure that, to borrow from the Hippocratic Oath, work does no harm. If you buy the lean principle that before you can make improvements, you must create a semblance of stability, then surely you would imagine that before you can make work better, you must start by making it safe and healthy. That's the subject of our guest Jeffrey Pfeffer's new book, Dying for a Paycheck, published earlier this year by Harper Business. In it, Jeff shares a wealth of daunting research that depicts a harsh world of work in which millions of Americans are not merely suffering from their jobs, but in fact experiencing dramatically severe stress and other factors that are actually lowering life expectancies. In the following conversation, we discuss this troubling state of the working union, and we explore ways that a lean mindset might offer productive countermeasures. Welcome to the LAI podcast. Today, I'm talking to uh, Professor Jeffrey Pfeffer, who teaches at the Stanford University Graduate School of Business. He's the author of many fantastic books, including The Knowing Doing Gap, Leadership BS, Power, and now he has a new book from Harper Business called Dying for a Paycheck. And um, it's, a, it's, a little, it's a little sobering, I must say. Um, I'm going to read. So welcome. Uh, welcome, Jeff, to the podcast. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. <laughs> um, let me just read a short passage from your book. Um, You say in your introduction that the workplace profoundly affects human health and mortality. In too many workplaces, places are harmful to people's health, that people are literally dying for paycheck. Most important, the situation is worse than I had imagined, affecting people in numerous occupations, industries, and geographies, and cutting across people of various ages and levels of education. So, this point is presented compellingly in your book. And to open it up, kind of two short questions. Um, how did this argument come to you? And because you've written books for, I, I, you know, 20 years, very, very serious, like really insightful business books. And if anything, this would reflect to me a growing um, dissolution <laughs> with business. Um, and I'm just, uh, that, that's how I want to kick it off, if, if I may. Sure. So the simple answer is that I have sat, you know, for years on the Stanford Committee for Faculty and Staff Human Resources, which is basically a committee which is obsessed with Stanford's health insurance costs. And um, and uh, I also was for a while, uh, when it still existed as a separate entity, on the, the Hewitt, um, before it became Aon Hewitt's Leadership um, Council, which was the head of a, heads of HR from some of their large client companies. And again, they were obsessed with health care costs. And it struck me just as a matter of simple common sense that um, that the emphasis was always on either insurance plan design or on what individuals could do um, to make themselves healthier, to eat better, to exercise more, et cetera, et cetera. And it just occurred to me that, um, uh, that, that we were not talking at all about work and work environments and if work environments might affect people's health relevant behaviors like smoking, drinking and overeating and which it, which by the way they do and if maybe work environments were a source of the problem and uh, so I, I was 
invited to participate in a conference, which never occurred. But as part of that, I began, I wrote a paper in 2010, actually, which talked about human sustainability. And as I looked into this literature, I found that there were literally probably a thousand studies going back literally decades that had talked about elements of work environments and their adverse effects on health and that nobody was paying attention to this for reasons which I can't even possibly conjecture. But um, I, it struck me that, the, that, that if we were going to solve the growing healthcare cost crisis and the healthcare crisis period uh, right. around the world, as you may know, for the last three years, life expectancy in the United States has gone down. Um, and healthcare costs are soaring both in the U.S. and everywhere else. That the that the, that the workplace and changes in the workplace had to be a part of the solution because the workplace is where people spend a lot of their time. And the workplace, according to many surveys, including by the American Psychological Association, is a leading source of stress. And stress yeah. is unhealthy. Right. And we understand why stress is unhealthy. And we understand how stress is unhealthy. So we need to do something about this. And in the words of one of my endorsers, the famous Tom Raff, he yeah. said he, when he when he read he read the manuscript before he did the endorsement, and he said, you know, he said he said this is wonderful. He says every time I turn the page, I kept thinking to myself, why hasn't somebody said this before? So it's kind of <laughs> it's kind of like a problem hiding in plain sight. Yes, and the evidence you present in the book is is kind of more compelling and pervasive than I had anticipated. It's uh, it's a little discouraging, to be honest. Well, uh, the evidence I presented in the book, I should point out, is only a fraction of the evidence that is, that, that, that is available. And there's more evidence that has come out since the book has been published. So, so yes, there is, there is an overwhelmingly compelling case to be made that the workplace does profoundly affect human health and well-being, and that there are you know, and that while OSHA has cleaned up, uh, and comparable agencies in the European Union have cleaned up um, mortality and morbidity due to kind of physical threats like you know saws and falling off ladders, uh, that the psychosocial stressors in the workplace, if anything, have gotten worse, and and the costs are enormous to both individuals and to companies and to society. And I don't find this I don't find this depressing. It's like saying you know the. It's it's it, it is a fact, and if and if right. and if we're going to address this, we need to see the problem and its enormous scope. Okay, well, I want to fast forward. So you're familiar with lean, uh, yep. derived out of the Toyota system. And I'm very familiar with lean, and I'm a fan of lean. Okay, uh, excellent. <laughs> One of the primary uh, uh, principles of lean is safety. This is one of Toyota's top priorities, and um, safety is considered just essential. Um, but beyond that, there's a very rigorous effort to define and operationalize respect for the individual. And this is less to do with perks and benefits and etiquette and much more to do with endowing the individual on the front line who does the work with the means to control it, to have autonomy, which is something you discuss in your book, and kind of to take ownership for um, improvement. And so kind of from a lean point of view, it, uh, one thing that struck me as I read the book was you're, it's almost about playing defense. You know, you talk about ways to halt this egregious behavior that's pervasive among companies that's killing people. And, you know, this is how do companies start to, what are some of the most effective ways that companies can, if they buy your argument, which they should, how do they shift to start uh, engaging people and treating folks with respect um, in a kind of operational way? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. My sense of lean 
and how I would use lean in this idea, in, the, in the idea to making workplaces uh, safer and healthier is not just to engage, this issue of employee engagement. I think that's a part of it, but 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 also, I mean, one of the reasons why people work so many hours. Yep. And one of the reasons why work is as stressful as it is is because there's a lot of waste. There's a lot of you know we we have so so somebody said you know I can yeah. give you examples if when you when you look at the organizations that are most fundamentally trying to improve the health and well-being of their workforce this begins with job yeah. design I I cannot make your work better and healthier if I'm going to leave off the table all aspects of what that work involves. And most companies today, unfortunately, say, well, work is the way it is. And, you know, we do what we do for whatever reasons why we do it. And, you know, good reasons, bad reasons, or no reasons. And so what we're going to do is we're going to try to remediate the stress that the work causes yeah. by, you know, nap pods and, you know, meditation and you know, better salad bars or whatever. But the, but the companies that are really going to solve the problem right. of, un, right. of of unsafe work, just as they've done this for for the phys, for physical safety, you have to begin by thinking about every aspect of the job and job design. And you have to, and that's where I think that there is a great deal of compatibility between the principles right. of lean and what I'm talking about. Because it begins with basically redesigning the work. Get rid of get rid of the stuff. That is harmful, unnecessary, stressful, could be automated, etc. And un until you do that, nothing much is going to happen. Excellent. And I think beyond that, Lean believes that it's more than it's more than just removing waste, which it uh, absolutely is. It's doing so in a way that's inclusive and. Um, actually puts pressure on the people who are doing the job to develop a mindfulness of, of what they're doing. Um, and it is both the kind of the process and these results. Um, yep. I agree so, with that. Okay. okay. I mean, it interests me you're saying it's not about the kind of um, uh, cosmetic um, flaws, uh, like fixing them. You're saying you go deeper into the design of the work and absolutely. deal with this at the root cause. Absolutely. And root cause is, of course, consistent with lean. And root cause analysis is consistent with lean principles, which, which, which it is. But more than that, I mean, you know, if I said to you, I want you to make um, I want you to make work safer in a physical sense, you know, you wouldn't just give people Band-Aids or, you know, bandages or something. You would actually say, you know, how do I redesign, you know, how do I redesign the use of saws, the use of ladders, you know, how do, how do I redesign the physical environment um, right. to, to, to make the workplace safer? How do I put guards on tools or, you know, so that people won't get their fingers caught in them, et cetera, et cetera? You would, you would, you would redesign the equipment. Well, you, is, just as we've redesigned the physical equipment, we have to redesign, be willing to re redesign the psychosocial aspects of work if we're going to make it psychologically healthier and less stressful. Hmm. You talk about, Bob, Chapman. Yep. Um, whose company, uh, I believe, uh, works hard at, at lean um, principles. Yep. Um, he also, by the way, does something which I think is unusual in today's world, which is he understands that when people go to work for an organization, they have put their psychological and physical well-being in the care of that organization. And Bob is personally and advocates for being a good steward of people's health and well-being. And many organizations, of course, don't don't neither acknowledge nor accept the responsibility for the well-being of the people who work for them. Interesting. Um, well, you know, I mean, for forty for forty years, HR people have said, you know, you are, you know, you're. You, your 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 career is your responsibility. We have you know no responsibility to offer you 
uh, employment security. There used to be on the great place to work lists of places that are great places to work, <laughs> companies that would have no layoff policies. Those are mostly gone. Um, right. You know, so right. people people basically have been told to fend for themselves, and uh, and and the companies do not accept very much responsibility for the well-being of their workforce, and and it shows in what happens. It's what's the reason why the statistics that you refer to are so depressing. Uh, they could not be anything other than that. I mean, if basically, if I say to you, you know, I don't care about your well-being, I'm not going to measure it. I'm not going to. Um, take care of it. I'm not going to, you know, do anything about it. You know, that, that, that it's one of the principles of the quality movement is that things that get measured get, you know, get some attention and get improvement and the things that are ignored get worse. So I can't understand why anybody is surprised that the condition of the workplace in terms of its psychosocial aspects is, um, is as bad as it is. Nobody's paying attention to it. Um, so one, uh, one question I had is, um, basically at what level? I mean, you just mentioned job redesign and it feels to me like there's a more sustainable, um, uh, um, opportunity for improvement by, uh, doing this inside out, by looking at kind of work design, um, and ownership and, and, and fundamentals. Yep as opposed to adding on, you know, um, perks and benefits that simply yep. watch your diet or um, so forth. Um, yep. What What would you say are some of the most, like, doable, um, understandable ways that companies, company leaders, that how, do, how do people tackle this issue? Well, I think you start with the things that cause people stress and you change them. So, so one big source of stress is economic insecurity. Bob Chapman, to use a name that you've already used, during the yep. 2008 recession, even though he runs a company which is in the manufacturing business, whose business fell off substantially, did not lay anybody off. Let's mention it's, he's CEO of uh, Barry Waymore. Yep. yep, that's correct. Yep. Um, you know, Whole Foods laid off fewer people than Stanford University did. Um, uh, Howard Bihar <laughs> left the board of Starbucks because of their uh, laying so many people off during the 2008 recession. So economic insecurity is an enormous source of stress, and it is relatively easy to 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 not use layoffs as the first, second, third, and fourth response to any kind of economic stringency. Um, and, uh, you know, that's number one. And number two, it is relatively easy, and there's the evidence that suggests it's actually more profitable to provide people their work schedules in advance so they can balance their other obligations and they know what their income is going to be. There was a study, I think, that said that when the gap uh, provided people stable schedules, their sales went up, uh, which is not surprising because people need a steady income and they need to – understand when they're going to be working. Um, so, you know, so it is possible to address economic insecurity by giving people some certainty about their schedules and some protection against job loss for things that are not their responsibility. It is certainly possible, and there's been a ton of studies about this, and as you know, the U.S. lags behind every other industrialized nation on this dimension to make it possible to, to work and have a family at the same time. You can give people paid leave. Some companies have started doing that. Some states are starting to require that. You can, you know, make accommodations for people. You can provide on-site daycare. You can do provide various forms of assistance to people so they are able to balance work and non-work obligations, which is an enormous source of stress. It is certainly possible uh, to give people more job autonomy, which you've already right. alluded to. Uh, right. You know, we've known for 40 years or 50 years or maybe even 60 years that, that that more job autonomy leads to higher levels of motivation and employee engagement. You can, you know, give stop micromanaging people. Um, you can cut down work hours. The Economist magazine and the OECD have these wonderful charts in which it shows 
you know, work hours by country and productivity by country. And of course, the relationship is quite linear and it's quite negative that the more hours the country works, the lower the per hour productivity. And this then has been um, a a finding that has been found at the industry level of analysis as well. And so, you know, you can you can stop having people work beyond the point when they're when they're exhausted. I mean, as Jim Goodnight, the CEO of SAS Institute, largest privately owned software company in the world, will tell you, if you've worked, if you come to work in the morning and you work eight hours at the end of the eight hours, you're probably not going to be at your best. Go home. You know, and he leaves the workplace every day at around five himself. I mean, you know, the, the, the idea, you know, if I said to you, you know, Tom, I want you to, have, you're, you're going to get operated on by a surgeon who's been up for 25 hours straight, you would probably be a little nervous as you should yeah. be. I mean, I, I mean, in many in many professions, including truck driving and airline pilots and men, the medical profession, we try to limit hours because we understand that beyond a certain point it becomes literally unsafe. So this idea that people are going to do good work when they when they're working 60, 80 hours a week is just insane. There's no evidence for this. And so you can do you can change the things that are causing people stress and ill health. And yeah. it's not that it's not that hard to do. Well could there also be just a a broader question that it's the wrong countermeasure that some of the jobs that people need to make less lethal (laughs) might be jobs that shouldn't exist at all that that maybe we need better jobs somehow and i know that's very abstract and by in the sky but i'm i'm just kind of uh, maybe. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, you know, some of these jobs, I suspect, are artificial intelligence or whatever will automate. But certainly you could look at, you know, you could look at what jobs there are. Uh, I mean, ironically, one of the things that affects people's health and is one of the elements of stress, particularly for the U.S. workforce, is uh, financial stress. And hmm. you know yep. this is the federal the fed statistics on on the statistics on the proportion of people who couldn't come up with four hundred dollars for an emergency or yeah. you know are living paycheck to paycheck and by the way, I've read a report recently that suggested that people living paycheck to paycheck or include people who are making is like a hundred thousand dollars a year, so it's not just low wage people who are under financial stress um and so um but certainly, we know that there's a relationship between salaries and health. And yeah. one of the questions we might ask as a society is whether we want to be the low-wage nation that we are. Because believe it or not, compared to many of the countries in the developed world, the U.S. is, is pays relatively poorly. Not our CEOs, of course, but the, but the, but the regular workers. Well, one of the most powerful books I've read in the past two years is Makers and Takers by Rana Farrar. Have, have you read this? What? One of the best books I've read in recent years is titled Makers and Takers by Financial Times journalist Rana Farrar. Yeah, no, I have not read it. <laughs> uh, her basic argument is that an increasing amount of economic activity is consumed by finance, that yep. the financialization of the economy leads to more uh, profits in a more uh, inequitable way consumed by finance and that it kind of infects other sectors, um, uh, you know, subsequently. And so I, I thought of that book as I was, I was reading this one. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, that's a, that's a, certainly the percentage of GDP that goes to labor is, and it all is really quite low and much lower than it has historically been. And the percentage of the GDP that has gone to profits has gone up. Uh, it's one of the reasons why the stock price is so high. Stock prices are so high. Is that it's not that the companies, I mean, the companies are making more money, but one of the reasons why they're making more money is because the, uh, the, the, the share of economic output going into profits is, is, is much higher than it has been. Okay. Well, I'm still going to try to wrestle this back to a like a positive, lean view of the world, um, and and ask kind of in a different way what 
if we think of operational practices, organ, you know, organizational policies that counteract uh, these pernicious things that are killing people, uh, tell me, you know, more than kind of limiting hours or what's the kind of way that the manager has to start thinking differently about um, the people. Well, it, goes, it goes back to what I said before. The manager needs to understand um, in, a, in a way that some people would think of as paternalistic, but I don't, that they are responsible for the health and well-being of their workforce. So, you know, I've, I'm on a mission, though okay. I'm probably going to fail at this, uh, to find a district attorney who is willing to arrest the CEO when they do a layoff for murder. <laughs> I think it only happens in Law and Order, the TV show. It's, but by the way, the evidence is enormously clear that layoffs kill people. It, the suicide rate goes up two and a half times. Cardiovascular disease goes up. Um, you know, depression, which by the way leads to ill health, goes up. So it is. So it is. So you know, I, if, if I if I came up and shot you, I would be arrested immediately. If right. I lay off thousands, or in the case of 3G with Heinz Craft, 15,000 people, which is going to result in enormous numbers of excess deaths. People think that you're kind of a capitalist hero. And I would like that to change. And by the, and, you know, I, I'm hoping that eventually that we will see litigation because this is not going to change by companies voluntarily right. doing anything. This is going to require legislation, regulation, and litigation. And I'm hoping that we will see at some point something comparable to the tobacco industry litigation, literally. I mean, because the evidence is as strong as it, uh, for these workplace practices as, as it was for tobacco. Um, wow. And, yep. um, you know, I think we need to hold companies accountable for what they're doing to their human beings who are, who've entrusted their lives to them. Interesting. Um, and, and it just also feels like we're kind of swimming against the tide. Take a company like Whole Foods, which you were talking about 20 years ago for their kind of team practices. And, uh, and they're now part a, of Amazon. And professor, what do you make of? Uh, if you, <laughs> I'm curious, what you make of that? What does that say to you? Well, it says to me that you know. And by the way, if you saw the speech that the famous um, what's his name? Who is their CEO? You remind me. Bezos, Jeff Bezos, or John Mackey? No, no, no the, the John Mackey. When John Mackey, after the, I think prior to the deal closing, but after it had been put in, in play, if you will, gave a talk in which he said, I think we may have taken care of our employees too well. Meaning? Meaning that times were going to get worse, which I'm sure they have. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's so it, it is, yes, it's, uh, it's, it, it is, it is, it's uh, you know it's 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 interesting. I mean Amazon just I can't even believe this, but every anything is possible is listed in the Wall Street Journal in a supplement as a company that is number one by some list of best companies produced by the Drucker Institute. And the comment that I and many other people have made is that Peter Drucker is turning over in his grave because Amazon is completely inconsistent, except in its emphasis on customers with the principles of Drucker. I mean, Drucker was somebody who I had the privilege of meeting and knowing, and he was yes. very concerned about employee well-being. Right. It's so we have we we have we have made heroes out of organizations that are notorious. I mean, David Streetfield and Jody Cantor have written articles about Amazon and their white collar thing. There are a ton of articles about the Amazons. It's you know. Yeah, and the irony is that Amazon is actually fairly lean in many of their organizational practices and how they. Um, address problems and attack them and uh, have a discipline of continuous improvement. Uh, the, but they do so, it appears, occasionally uh, or more than occasionally by making um, people into instruments of yep. the Amazon machine. Yep. 
Absolutely. Um, yeah, and that's that to me feels a little uh, discouraging because they are arguably the most successful company of the past decade, and uh, their HR policies are not looking um, encouraging. Nope. Nope. And but that's because of how we've defined success. You know, I you know, I think we need to make human life and human well being at least as important as economic outcomes. I mean, you know, what profit what does it profit us, uh, you know, right. to have a fabulously high GDP if life expectancy is d- d- diminishing? You know, what what does it profit you know, us as a society uh, to have um, high stock market with a suicide rate that's up 70% in the last eight or nine years uh, with a widespread depression, et cetera. I mean, it's, we, we need a much broader definition of what success looks like. And certainly, I would think, you know, if I say to you, you know, what's the old Jack Benny joke, the money or your, your, your money or your life? <laughs> right. um, you know, I mean, for, for a country, and this was said to me by a very conservative Catholic woman, she said, for a country that talks about being pro-life and pro-family, your country, talking about us in the United States, she's a Spanish woman, she said, you know, she's your country that doesn't seem to value life or families at all. We only value life until it emerges from the womb, and then, boy, you're on your own. Yeah, yeah. And the this uh, infects the daily operations of uh, the multitude of our companies. Uh, okay. On that happy note, um, I, I think we can try to keep this to a manageable half hour. Uh, and uh, Professor Jeffrey Pfeffer, let us mention the book Dying for Paycheck. It's excellent. And um, I want to thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure talking to you. Good <laughs> luck. Fascinating thoughts to be sure, and something that I believe is central to all serious lean work. I want to thank Jeff Pfeffer for his work and for his time, and I want to thank the members of the WLAI team, Emma Ripp, Lori Moniz, Rebecca Whitehouse, and Matt Savas for helping produce this. And of course, I want to thank you, our listener, for listening. If you have suggestions on topics you'd like us to discuss, email us at pod at lean.org. And tune in next Monday for another episode of WLEI.